Oh, I should look up there. Uh, am I looking right? Okay, tell me when. Okay. Hi, I'm Brad Gottfried. I'm the author of, I think, 11 books on the Civil War. And uh, this is the most recent one. It is called The Maps of Fredericksburg. And I'm here at the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable in beautiful Wisconsin, uh, the Wisconsin Club. And we're talking about, I'm going to be speaking about this particular book. I've written a number of other books relating to maps. And I don't know if you want to see them. But uh, on one side is the map, and the other side is the, the description, and there are about 125 of them in these books. So uh, uh, I've done them on First Bull Run, Antietam, uh, Gettysburg, Wilderness, so I uh, have done a lot of these, and we're excited about being here this evening. Um, you want to show your other book too, then? I can certainly do that. The other book I've actually written with my wife, uh, this is Hell Comes to Southern Maryland. This is about the Point Lookout Civil War um, prisoner of war camp in St. Mary's County, Southern Maryland. In, um, it started in 1863. It ran until 1865. It was the largest Civil War camp for prisoners of the Confederacy. So if you were captured at Gettysburg, there's a good chance that you as a Confederate soldier were going to be incarcerated at Point Lookout. Um, it's not a very large book, but it tells the story in a very impartial way, and we're, uh, we're excited to have done that as well. Thank you. We spoke around for the last, what, two hours? And uh, <laughs> it's a wonderful person. So Thank you. Go ahead. <laughs> he is Dr. Dr. Bradley M. Godfrey with a PhD in zoology from Miami University. Which one? The real one or the one in Florida? <laughs> <laughs> Tonight he's going to illustrate the Battle of Fredericksburg using many, many maps, uh, colorful as it were. He is an avid Civil War historian and the author of, I found out tonight, the, the General Orders of Law, it's now 11, 13 books, some of which are on sale tonight, so line up when it's all done and buy my books. He's got a discount on there. Uh, many of those books are military atlases, and if you live, read the General Orders and see which battles he's covered. He's recently retired from education. He worked in education for, uh, higher education for like 40 plus years. Two of his stints were one in uh, Iowa and one in, up in Fond du Lac, in addition to Savannah and other places south. Uh, he has tonight's presentation promising to be highly informative. And as I said before, he has books for sale. Brad? Well, it is a pleasure to be back. It seems that it wasn't that long ago I was in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. And I'm not just saying this, but when they talk about quality of life issues, places like Fond du Lac is a great place to raise a family, and, and we really do, do miss it. We're currently living, my wife and I, Linda, uh, outside of Gettysburg, and uh, it doesn't get much better than that. What I'm going to be doing tonight is talking about a campaign. Uh, the Fredericksburg campaign, and many of you may not know about what I do, what my passion is, but some of you do, and that is I illustrate campaigns. For those of you who study the Civil War, there's never enough maps in any book. And so what these uh, map books try to do, whether it's Gettysburg, whether it's, Pe well, it's going to be Petersburg, First Bull Run, Antietam, there's about 124 full color maps and on one side is the map, and on the other side is the description of what happened. So you don't have to tromp around the Fredericksburg battlefield, especially when it happened in November, uh, December. Uh, you can actually be an armchair uh, historian. And thank you for the plug. Uh, I brought 14, I shipped 14 books here, so help me not bring them home. Uh, they normally sell for, four t uh, for 40, we're selling them for 30. What a deal, and I'll even throw in an autograph. 
But the main thing is for me to illustrate what happened. And I'm going to go back and forth, but let me get started, if I may. Um, if we put it in perspective, remember, we have the Army of the Potomac under, well, under a variety of commanders. Most recently, it was under George McClellan. Seven day battles outside of Richmond. And then the infamous, or famous, what if you have it, uh, first Maryland campaign, the first, Lee's first invasion of the North. And after that campaign was concluded, Abraham Lincoln again wanted the war to end. And the only way he felt the war could end was to capture Richmond. McClellan, despite having earned a victory at Antietam, did not want to continue to campaign as fast as Lincoln wanted him to. And so, Lincoln removes McClellan from command and puts in his place Ambrose Burnside, commander of the Federal Ninth Corps. And there was never a commander of the Army of the Potomac who wanted to be in command less than this man. He did, that was the last thing he could consider. And the only way Lincoln would get him to serve as the leader of the Army of the Potomac was by telling him, if you don't take this job, I'm gonna give it to your arch enemy. Hooker, Joseph Hooker, I'll take it, don't do it. He's got a, he's got a great army. It, it suffered great, uh, very, very high losses at Antietam, but the numbers had grown, morale was high. You can see about 125,000 men in this army. His problem was not the army, his problem was Lincoln, Lincoln and Henry Halleck, the general in chief who liked to take a very active approach in strategy. And so it wasn't, okay, we're gonna let you, we're gonna give you the Army Burnside, we're gonna let you do whatever you wanna do with them. It was, let's talk about it, let's negotiate, let's figure out to, collectively what's going to happen. On the other side is Robert E. Lee, commanding an army that is almost as large as the army later on at Gettysburg. He's still recovering from Antietam. It was his first setback. Some would say it was a draw, but he was pushed back from uh, Maryland. His problem is he doesn't have his whole army with him. So here's the first map, and hopefully you'll be able to, to see it, and I'm gonna go down here. So it all relates to on to Richmond, and how are we going to capture Richmond? Well. You can see, and hopefully you can follow the bouncing pointer, uh, the Army of the Potomac, these are divisions that are marching from Northern Virginia down toward Fredericksburg, because what Burnside wants to do is cross the river, the Rappahannock River, at Fredericksburg and drive south and capture Richmond. And if he did this early on in November, early in November of 1862, he may have been successful. You can see Lee's army is actually split in half. He has two wings, one under James Longstreet, and that is further south. It's within striking distance of Fredericksburg. It's about Culpeper's, Culpeper Courthouse. But the other corps, Jackson, Stonewall Jackson's corps, is way up in the Shenandoah Valley. We know Stonewall Jackson loved the Shenandoah Valley. He was an instructor at VMI. But also he needed more forage. He needed food for the horses, et cetera. He couldn't get it with the rest of the army. He could get it in the Shenandoah Valley. And he said, look, if you need me, I will get there as soon as I possibly can. So it's okay for me to be as far away as, as I am right here. The, um, so we have a split Confederate Army, and we have a Union Army that's marching very rapidly south, but there's one problem, and that is this body of water called the Rappahannock River. The Rappahannock River, you cannot ford. It's too deep. The banks are too steep. You need pontoon bridges. You're gonna need about 80 or 90 of them to make this, these, um, these bridges. And the problem is, they're not with the Army. They're way up north. 
And the problem that Burnside is going to have is he's relying on other people like Halleck to get those bridges south to him. And we're going to see that it doesn't happen. That the attack actually occurs, it's a one day battle on December the 13th. It's going to take over a month for these bridges to come down and be close to being put into position uh, along the Rappahannock River. So, the end of November, 1862, it's November 22nd. You have 35,000 men. Longstreet has moved over now. He's behind Fredericksburg because, the, because Lee now knows that Fredericksburg is potentially the place that Burnside is going to be crossing at. So here you can see the, the Union Army uh, concentrating around Fredericksburg on the North Bank. South Bank is Longstreet, but he's only got about 35,000 men. The rest of them are under Stonewall Jackson. And if 122,000 men decide to push across that river, no 35,000 men are ever going to stop them. Problem was there's no pontoon bridges. And so one of the characteristics of Jackson was he had foot cavalry, meaning they could march very, very fast. And it is amazing to see how fast they did march during this time to catch up with the rest of Lee's army. Uh, they're averaging about 27 miles a day. What's so fascinating is many of these men had, were shoeless, and yet they're still making this very, very rapid movement uh, to join the, Union, uh, the Confederate army. So even though Lee knows that uh, Burnside is going to cross the Rappahannock River, he's not exactly certain where. Is he going to do it opposite Fredericksburg? Or maybe he's going to cross somewhere downstream. He just doesn't know. And what would happen if Burnside decides that he's going to concentrate, he's, he's going to cross down here, and if Lee has all of his troops opposite Fredericksburg, it's not going to be a pretty sight. So he's going to, Lee's going to hedge his bet. He's going to put half of his army across from Fredericksburg, but he's going to distribute Jackson's Corps along the southern portion of the city, facing all of the areas that Burnside could cross. Getting these pontoon bridges is not easy. Uh, eventually what they're going to do is literally throw them in the water and, and float them down the um, Potomac River, down the Chesapeake, and finally in position to Fredericksburg. And they're not going to arrive until early December, actually like the second week in December or so. So during this time, Burnside is waiting and what is happening? The Confederate Army is getting bigger and bigger and bigger as it concentrates. Imagine being Burnside, knowing you've lost that opportunity. Now you may not be able to see this very well, especially those of you in the back. Can you sort of make that out if you squint a little bit? Well, let me explain some things. Uh, right here is Stafford Heights. How many of you, by the way, have been to the Fredericksburg battlefield? Let me see some hands. Oh, good, okay. For the rest of you, you gotta visit. It's a great place. Stafford Heights is right here on um, the eastern side of the Rappahannock River. Here's Fredericksburg. On the opposite side, there's a range of hills uh, starting from Telegraph Hill going all the way down to Prospect Hill. So the Confederates are gonna be on this line of hills, the Union's gonna be on this line of hills, and eventually the Union forces are gonna win across. On the heights, there's 150 long range cannon aiming toward the Confederate positions on the hills on the opposite side. We are going, the Burnside's plan, and he's going to begin this on the December 12th, the day before the battle, is he's going to get his engineers to begin to build one, two bridges here in the upper part of town, another bridge here on the southern part of town, and further south, two more bridges, okay? As soon as these engineers begin their bridge building exercises, guess what happens? They get shot at. Uh, William Bar uh, Barksdale's Mississippians are in the town and they're sharpshooters. They are probably one of Lee's toughest units. 
and they are taking pot shots at the engineers. Now, engineers are not fighters, they're builders. And when they start getting hit, they retreat very quickly. They're saying, uh uh, we're out of here. And the bridge building activities stop in their tracks. They bring up some Union troops to fire across the river. There's some limited artillery attacks from the Union side of the river. They cannot get rid of Burnside's men, not Burnside, excuse me, Barksdale's men. They cannot get rid of those Mississippians. So what do you do? If you're Ambrose Burnside and standing between you and crossing the river is a group of maybe 1,500 Mississippians who are dispersed, what would you do? That's exactly right, thank you. You may have to come on up here and help me. Thank you. That's exactly right. He takes those 150 guns and he opens fire on this southern town. And he destroys every single building. Every building is either destroyed or uh, damaged in one way or another. And after several hours, the guns fall silent. The engineers are all set. They get back onto the bridges they, with their little hammers, etc. And guess what? Pop, 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 they start falling. Because these marksmen, these uh, Mississippians, they weren't driven out, they were driven down into the basements. And you stop the cannonade and off they come and they start opening fire again. So what do you do next? Well, oh, this is what Fredericksburg looks like, by the way. What you do is the first successful amphibious assault in U.S. history. Some would say, well, when Washington crossed the Delaware, wasn't that an amphibious assault? Well, it wasn't against enemy fire. The 7th Michigan hops into these pontoon bridges, 20 to 25 men per, per pontoon bridge, uh, boat, and they're going to row as quickly as they can across the river. And they're going to get shot at, and many of them are going to get killed or wounded, but eventually they, they get across, and then other boats join them, and they start to get a toehold, and they start to push the uh, Mississippians away from the riverbank. And so you can see the partially built bridges. You can see uh, the, well, you can't really see, but these are little boats crossing. And you can see that there are now some blue dots as the, the Union troops are now starting to move into the town of Fredericksburg. There's going to be some hand-to-hand some -hand combat. There's going to be fighting in the streets. They're actually going to go house to house, similar to what happened in World War II in Germany and in France, trying to expel these marksmen from these homes. More and more troops are going to get across. And then uh, one regiment, the Harvard Regiment, the 20th Massachusetts. Many of these men are, for, are students, past students, current students from Harvard University. They land and they are going to move up. And those of you who are taking a tour, who have taken a tour, you can walk up. You can stand right here. This is where they were crossing. You can see the Union gun positions across the river. They, they marched up Hawk Street, which is still there, to Caroline Street, right here, and where all hell breaks loose, where they are going to be hit from three sides and devastated. I mean, I won't say hundreds, but tens of men are falling, killed, wounded. Uh, more reinforcements are going to come up. Eventually, they're going to drive these marksmen away from uh, these homes. And you can see more and more Union troops are now entering the town. What's interesting is Barksdale has done his job. What was he supposed to do? Not only was he supposed to stop Burnside from getting across, he was really trying to buy time. Because Stonewall Jackson was way to the south, wanted to buy some time for those troops to come into the town and uh, take their position on the hills behind it. It was successful. But William Burnside was not going to be denied. He did not want to leave the town. They were actually going to court-martial him and threatened him, but his blood was up that he was wanted to stay with his Mississippians in that town. Eventually, he was, I think they threatened him enough that he, he pulled his men out, but he'd done his job. 
So here it is uh, later on, again the day before the battle. The bridges are now complete and the Union troops have now crossed the river. And what happens now is probably one of, well it depends what your orientation is, um, probably one of the greatest tragedies I consider in American history. And that is when American troops went into a southern town and totally destroyed it. Uh, we saw the cannonade, but imagine going into all of these troops going into, uh, into houses with beautiful furniture and pulling out sofas and pulling out beautiful pianos and breaking them with their muskets and ripping up library books and, and tearing up clothing, women's clothing, men's clothing. Uh, and the officer is doing nothing. Now, what I find interesting is guess who occupies Gettysburg a year later or less than six months later, July 2nd and 3rd? The Confederates. And what do they do? Nothing. No, they, don't. they don't do anything. They go into homes, they look for food, they look for Union prisoners, but they don't destroy anything, which is interesting. Anyway, that's another discussion. So, Burnside is going to try this head-on attack. He's across the Rappahannock River. He, you know, his option, one option is to do nothing, which is not, that's going to get him replaced by Lincoln. Uh, he could try, once he's across the river, to move around Lee's right flank. That's not going to work. And finally, he decides he's going to do a head-on attack. He thinks he can be successful. He's going to bludgeon Lee's army. Whoops. Now, many of you have heard of William Franklin. William Franklin commands the left flank of the Union Army. And he says to Burnside, look, and this again is the evening of the 12th, the evening before the battle. And he says, look, Ambrose, if you give me 60,000 men and you let me charge the heights this way under cover of darkness because they could, they could see all the Confederate artillery but they couldn't see all the uh, Confederate infantrymen. So they see the hill and he says, I can take this hill with 60,000 men but I have to do it before dark, before light because otherwise the, the, the cannon are gonna just rip us apart. And Burnside says, yeah, that's great. I'm going to get you specific orders before, well before daylight. So Franklin never goes to sleep. Midnight, he's waiting. One o'clock in the morning, two o'clock in the morning, three o'clock and four o'clock. Guess what? The sun's coming up. Yeah. He's lost his opportunity. And where were those orders? Well, it took a long time for them to be transcribed. And the orderly who brought them got lost. Finally, when he brings them, it says not 60,000 men, it says one division. Take one division and attack those heights. But it was very garbled, 5,000 men. All right. So, here it is, the morning of the 13th. It's the morning of the battle. And we're looking at the right flank of Lee's army. This is where Stonewall Jackson is. Each of these, by the way, is a brigade. Probably about 1,500, maybe 2,000 men each. And here is the first corps under John Reynolds. Doubleday's division, you have Meade's division, you have Gibbon's division. The Iron Brigade, where is the Iron Brigade? What division? First. Right, well, it's with Doubleday. So it's, it's one of these units right here. So they're getting into position and at 10 o'clock they're going to charge the Confederate lines, okay? And he's going to send in not just one division, he's going to send in all three, the heck with it. And all of a sudden, as they're about ready to charge, imagine you're lined up and you're about ready to charge, all of a sudden these, these shells start bursting all over, all around you coming from the left. But what happened was right here, many of you have heard about John Pelham. 
John Pelham commands the artillery for uh, Jeb Stuart's cavalry. He takes one, one cannon and he's gonna open fire on 15,000 men and he's gonna delay the advance for one hour. And he's gonna keep moving, they're, they're going to bring, the uh, Union guns are gonna swivel, they're gonna open fire on him, but they can't silence him. He keeps moving the position of his gun around so that they can't, they won't actually take it out. Eventually he runs out of ammunition and after an hour he pulls back and the attack now occurs an hour later than it was supposed to. But something else happens which really hurt the attack. One full division, doubles, double day's division never gets into the battle because Franklin is so worried about this flank and the artillery that are gone that he never sends in the Iron Brigade. He never sends in Doubleday's division. So you remove one, uh, one third of your attacking force. Now you only have Meade and you have Gibbon. Okay, so the battle is about ready to begin. And when we think about Fredericksburg, what do we usually think about? What's the hill that usually we think about being attacked? Yes, Moray's Heights, right? But that's not where much, that is, and that is a major component of the battle. But most of us don't realize, and what I'm gonna talk about to, uh, tonight before I get to Moray Heights, is that so much occurred at the opposite end of the line. In fact, Lee was almost destroyed because of the attacks of these two divisions. We don't hear much about that. Now, Lee is vulnerable because right here, you can look at all these Confederate troops right here. See that? And there's more Confederate troops here, but there's nothing here. Do you all see that? There's a 600 yard gap. Why? Why would Stonewall Jackson, why would AP Hill, this is AP Hill's sector, this is, he's a division commander now, why would there be no Confederate troops right there? Anyone? Well, that's a possibility, but the, the terrain. There is, imagine you're a soldier. It's December the 13th. This is all wet, it's all marshy. So if you go into that area, guess what you're gonna do? You're gonna be in, in, in water that's up to your ankles. Do you want to be in water up to your ankles in, on December the 13th? Absolutely not, unless you want to get sick and get pneumonia and die. And so Stonewall says, you know what, and AP Hill, they're not going to attack here. There's no way, they're not going to get their feet wet. And what happens? They do attack there. Meade is going to uh, approach right through this one area right here, as we'll see, boom. So here is Meade attacking, and these are all regiments, we don't have to worry about that, but it does get down into, that, into the weeds, so to speak. But uh, two of his brigades are going to come toward the railroad into this marshy area and start to go up the hill. Up the hill is Maxie's Gregg South Carolina, uh, South Carolina Brigade. And these guys have no idea what's going on they don't realize that there are no Confederate troops in front of them. And they're sitting there eating, they've got their arms stacked, their rifles stacked, and they're basically just taking it easy. And all of a sudden, through the underbrush, some of these Carolinians see something that looks like Yankees coming in their direction. And they're about ready to open fire, when Maxie Gregg comes over and says, whoa, 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 you can't open fire on those men, those are our men. Oh. And also Maxie Gregg was hard of hearing. So he couldn't hear that they were also shooting at them. And what happens? They hit the flank. When you hit a column's flank in the Civil War, it's basically over. And they're gonna roll up this flank and totally defeat these South Carolina troops. Maxie Gregg is gonna take a bullet to the side, it's gonna split his spinal cord, he's gonna die an agonizing death two days later. And look what happens. The entire brigade is going to be defeated and guess what? 
right in the middle of Stonewall Jackson's line are nothing but Yankees that can turn left and turn right, and if they have reinforcements, they can beat Lee. Well, they're not content with just attacking Gregg's brigade. They also attack another Confederate brigade, again on the flank, Archer's brigade by this railroad. And they're going to do the same thing. They're going to roll it up and they're going to destroy it. And they're going to send it to the rear. Uh, that's, and so that's me. George Meade's doing all of this. His men were doing very, very well. They defeated two Confederate uh, brigades very quickly. John Gibbon, he has a division. He's also going to be attacking. And he's going to drive a Confederate brigade away from the railroad, as you can see. They're going to quickly retreat. And so in a very short period of time, we're going to see that the Union troops have basically taken Prospect Hill. They need reinforcements. They're waiting for reinforcements. But who are the reinforcements that come? They're not Union. They're Confederate. So Stonewall Jackson is going to bring in all of these troops that are going to then uh, congregate into the area. This one is composed of the Stonewall Brigade that you may have heard of uh, from First Bull Run fame. Its commander, Eliza pa Paxton, was very, very fussy. So he lines his troops up. He has to hit these men, these Pennsylvania Reserve troops from Meade's division. He's going to hit them in the flank, but he wants to make sure that the line is perfect. And the men are saying, let's get moving. Let's attack those Yankees. He says, nope, nope, you're not in line. And he makes sure that they're fully in line. John, um, Jim Walker's brigade comes up. He says, what's this BS? He says, I'm not waiting for you guys. He goes right through the line and he attacks. Um, he's going to attack these troops right here. And it's going to drive, as you can see, Walker has gone right through them, drives them back. You're going to see Lane is going to start to counterattack. And these Union troops, here's another Confederate um, brigade coming up. Uh, so more and more of these brigades are coming up to seal the breach. And then finally, the fighting is going to end at the southern end of the field when Atkinson's brigade, which later at Gettysburg is com uh, commanded by John um, Gordon. They take Barlow Knoll. This is the brigade at Sharpsburg that opens the fight at the cornfield. This is the brigade in the wilderness that it gets on the flank of the Union Army and rolls it up on the 6th of, of uh, May. And here they are counterattacking. And this area, by the way, how many of you belong to the Civil War Trust or the American Trust? They now own this field. It is called the Slaughter Pen Farm. And if you've been to Fredericksburg, all of this area, all around it, are all factories, they're all warehouses. And you see this nice, beautiful green area owned for perpetuity by the trust. But not only are they going to drive these Yankees off the hill, they're going to charge across this open field, and eventually they're going to be repulsed. And that is going to end the, um, the attack on Prospect Hill. So that's what's happening right off the bat. A lot of people don't understand that or learn about that because they're so busy with Murray Heights. But it's one where Stonewall Jackson was almost beaten handily and Lee was almost knocked off of Prospect Hill. Losses are comparable, as you can see. But the bottom line is the Confederate attack, counterattack, prevailed. What I want to talk about now is, um, how are we doing time-wise? You doing okay? We have, a, we have another meeting coming up, so. Um, Murray Heights. So here is Murray Heights. Here is the sunken road. And there is a stone wall right there. And it's, it's nice in that if you go to Fredericksburg, a section of the wall, original wall, is still there. Much of it has been uh, recreated. But you have all of these Union troops marching into the town. And they are going to be launching their charges 
from the town. They have to come uh, uh, through the town. And by the way, the Confederates are not just saying, hey, charge us when you want to. Their artillery, there's 13 guns or nine guns from the um, Washington artillery from Louisiana, but there are dozens of others all along these heights. And as they march through the town, these guns are opening fire. And if you think shrapnel is bad, imagine when a shell hits masonry and the f it flies all over like shrapnel. Not pleasant. So these troops are gonna come through the town and then they have to cross something called a mill race. It's a stream where that concentrates the men. The problem is there are bridges across this, this stream called a mill race, <clears throat> excuse me, that the Confederates have destroyed. So that you're gonna see little stringers that they have to get across that's going to create some havoc as they're trying to cross over the mill race to get into position. As soon as they cross the mill race, they're going to form into uh, lines of battle and they're gonna charge this open field toward these Confederates, and this is one brigade initially under Thomas Cobb. Uh, they're Georgians, they're also North Carolinians. And that's what it's gonna look like. So you have these uh, Georgians behind this stone wall that's gonna open fire on these charges. And what I find so fascinating and so perplexing is what happened during the afternoon hours. Um, French's division is going to attack. Three brigades, they don't attack all together, they attack individually. They're all defeated. Hancock, or Hancock's division is going to attack. Three more attacks, three more repulsed. Howard's division, Sturgis's division, Griffin's division, Whipple's division, Humphrey's division, Sykes's division, Getty's division, it's dark. 21 separate attacks on Moray Heights. Individual brigades, never more than one, every single one repulsed with bloody, bloody losses. What was, what was Burnside thinking? We don't really know. Oh, let me do this here. Come on. And I'm not going to go through every one of them, but what you, you, you'll follow along and you'll see the first attack is uh, Kimball's brigade. And right in the middle of the field, there's something called a swale. It's this, this high ground, it's just like a, a mound. And after you've been repulsed, do you, want to, do you want to go back to Fredericksburg necessarily? What's gonna happen if you try to retreat to, uh, to Fredericksburg? You could get shot in the back. So many of these men are going to burrow down behind this mound and we're gonna see this, the line of troops behind the swale is gonna get bigger and bigger and bigger as these charges occur, continue. Andrews Brigade right here is going to attack. It's gonna be repulsed. Palmer's Brigade is going to attack. You can see right here, it's gonna be repulsed. So this one division loses 1,200 men. Almost, I mean, we're talking within half an hour. Okay, just another one, all right, attacking. This is the Irish Brigade, and the Irish Brigade gets pretty far. Um, they're gonna get to the, the Stratton House, they're gonna get to an orchard, they get within yards of the stone wall before they're pushed back. I mean, any man who gets this close never sees um, uh, victory, and most of them are gonna be killed or wounded. Caldwell's Brigade is going to attack, as you can see. So Hancock's division loses 2,000 men. It's getting worse. How, uh, Howard's division, the Philadelphia Brigade, is going to be going across. It's gonna be defeated. Hall's Brigade, now we're going a little bit to the north. It's gonna attack, it's gonna be defeated. Sully's Brigade is the only smart one because it never really attacks. So it basically says, yeah, we're gonna stay right here, never mind. It only, this division only loses 900 men. Uh, Sturgis, um, you can see Ferreira's brigade. You're gonna see Nagel. Now Nagel's gonna try a different attack. Ah, we're not gonna attack straight ahead. We're gonna go on the flank, okay? It's gonna be defeated. 
This division loses 1,000 men. Uh, Griffin, you can see again they're going to be attacking from this direction. And then Schweitzer's brigade is going to attack. It's the, so this division loses 1,000 men. Carroll is going to be attacking. And what's interesting is Stockton's brigade. Anybody know who this, oh, this man is right there, supposedly? That's supposed to be Joshua Chamberlain. Oh. This is the 20th Maine is in Stockton's brigade. It's going to be attacking. It's going to be repulsed. But this division only loses about 100 men. Why? I think what's happening is they're starting to say, you know what, we don't really want to do this. And I think they pulled back sooner than the others. They didn't get as far. Humphreys' division is interesting because Andrew Humphreys, who becomes a chief of staff for, um, for Meade's army during the Overland campaign, he wants glory at all costs. And he's going to send his two brigades, Alibox, as you can see here, and Tyler's brigade here. He's going to send them across this field with unloaded guns, only bayonets. And he says, do not stop. You charge across. As they get to the swale, and look at all these individual broken up units. The, these guys are Pennsylvanians. Okay? Members of the Philadelphia Brigade grab their legs and beg them, do not go forward. You're going to be massacred. And Humphrey says, keep going. They eventually charge, and you can see they lose over 1,000 men. And when Andrew Humphreys files his report, and he says, my, my division has been defeated. Why? Is it because his men didn't fight hard? No. Is it because of the Confederates? No. It's because of those darn Philadelphia Brigade members that got in the way of my attack. Sykes' division, look how they're attacking now, straight from, from uh, almost from the south. They're going to be defeated. Buchanan and Andrews, they lose about 200. Getty. Now, it is dark. They can't even see the Confederate lines, but they're still attacking. How do they know where the Confederate lines are? They, all they have to do is look at the gunfire, the, the flashes from the muzzles. They're going to be defeated as well. And so here's the end. 70, almost 8,000 men have died in just a few, killed, wounded, missing in just a few hours from these crazy attacks. Charge after charge, whereas the Confederates lose about 1,000. Overall, this is what it looks like. This is probably one of the most lopsided battles of all the Civil War. Almost 13,000 versus 5,000, and you can understand why. Well, what would you do if you're Ambrose Burnside? What do you do on the 14th? The 13th, you've been totally dis de beaten. Every attack has been repulsed. Do you say, OK, Lincoln, I'm done. I'm going into winter quarters? No. He says to his generals, we're going to do it again. We're going to attack tomorrow. But the difference is I, Ambrose Burnside, will lead the attack. And his subordinates are smart enough to say, no, you're not because we're done, you're not using our troops. And he says, fine. But Lincoln is not done with him yet. Lincoln wants another offensive, he wants this war over. And so he says to Burnside, how are you going to launch another campaign against Lee? And he says, I'm gonna flank, and it was a, it was a good idea. I'm gonna flank Lee, I'm gonna go around his right flank, and when he's not looking, I'm going to get to Richmond, and I'm going to capture it, and the war's over. Boom. And when the time comes in mid-January for, for the movement to occur, the heavens open up. There's a nor'easter. It is raining. It is hailing. It is snowing. The winds are blowing. And everything is a mess, including any wheeled vessel or a vehicle is going to be stuck in the mud. It's called Burnside's Mud March. At that point, Lincoln has had enough. Burnside has had enough. 
They're done with each other. Burnside leaves the army, goes back to Rhode Island for a while. And who takes his place? Joseph Hooker, right. Who actually did a very good job getting this very demoralized army. Imagine being a, a, a man in one of these units that has charged up Moray Heights. You've lost so many of your comrades and you are expected to fight some more. Well, Hank, um, Hooker did a very good job of, um, of getting the army back in shape. Okay, I do want to show you one thing. If I have, do I have three minutes? Sure. Okay, I can explain this all day, but you really don't get to feel it. How many of you have seen the movie Gods and Generals? Okay, good. It's, uh, the battle scenes are great. So let me see if I can get it up. Hopefully. Yep. All right, so the first, oh. We're going to see little snippets here. My wife tells me don't show them blowing everybody up, but just get a flavor. But we're going to start to see um, the 20th Maine is going to be crossing the pontoon bridges. And I'll explain some of the things um, that occur. And we'll just get a flavor of what it was like. There's, the sound is, um, we don't really need the sound. So, and this is going to be short. Uh, you can see that it, on the right is supposed to be Joshua Chamberlain. You can see the men uh, crossing the pontoon bridge. Um, you'll see some shots of the Confederate artillery up on the heights. And here's the men behind the stone wall. All right, so the 20th Maine has crossed the pontoon bridge. It's coming uh, into the town of Frederick. I like the movie because it really shows you the magnificent lines of Union troops crossing that open field. All right, I'm going to jump ahead. Let's see. Okay, I think this is it. Shoulder to shoulder against these massed artillery pieces on Murray Heights. This sure reminds you of Pickett's Charge a little? Very similar to Pickett's Charge, just in reverse. Yeah. The Union artillery, the Confederate artillery, uh, shoulder to shoulder, the same results, open field, very good. And it is amazing to me that they continued to charge. They did not fall back in the middle of the field. They kept going as far as they could. They got to the swale and sometimes beyond the swale before they would stop. Okay, so I mean, I could show you more of this, but my wife says, nope. <laughs> Enough. Enough, Brad. I think you got the message. So, just to give a flavor, and again, why I like maps is because you can truly understand what happened rather than simply the verbiage. So, thank you for your attentiveness. Does anyone have any questions for me? Yes. How come the Union artillery on Stafford Heights wasn't able to pummel the top of Mary's Heights? They did. They were very active, and you had, you had Confederate losses. They kept bringing up new artillery pieces from the rear. Uh, but just like Pickett's Charge, oftentimes many of the shells from Stafford Heights would go over the ar Confederate artillery on the Heights, similar to what happened at Gettysburg. Yeah. So it was a little bit more effective than the Confederate artillery at Gettysburg, but not a whole lot more. But it's a good question. Thank you. Yes? Is the base of your maps 1860 to 1865 or current oh, no. triangle maps or what? They are period from the period. Right. So, you know, if you look at the Civil War Trust maps, they'll have the current road system. I don't have the current road system because I think it's confusing. 
And also, if you look, and I love those maps, and I love what the trust does, but they try in one map to put all kinds of movements in different color, red and blue, and it gets very, very confusing. Yeah. Any other questions that you might have? Yes? Why was it difficult for the pontoon bridges to come down when they were supposed to come down? Ah, you mean why, what, what? Why what? they delay? Okay. So the problem was that Halleck, who was responsible, misled Burnside. They were further up toward, many of them were up toward Harper's Ferry. And he thought that they would be able to come down sooner. But what's interesting is Burnside was getting so upset that he actually arrested his chief engineer, General Woodruff, um, because of his insubordination and his in, uh, incompetence. When in fact, he actually released him from uh, arrest when he realized that it was Halleck who had done it. And Halleck, well, I don't think Halleck intentionally tried to sabotage him, but I think we've seen Halleck in other theaters of the war where he was maybe not as good as he was projected to be. So he oversold what he could do. He should have been more honest with Burnside that I'm gonna get you your bridges, but it's not gonna be until the beginning of December. And there were also logistical issues getting those, those uh, pontoon bo uh, boats to Fredericksburg. They tried to bring them overland and that didn't work. And they finally had to put them in the water. So there were a lot of issues there. Thank you. Any others? If not, I'll be hanging around, so thank you very much. Thank you. Oh. Brad, on behalf of the uh, Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee, present you with the Certificate of Honor by order of the General Staff of the Civil War Roundtable of Milwaukee. This award is presented to Brad Gottfried for furthering our understanding of the causes and consequences of the American Civil War the watershed event in our nation's history. Great, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yes. We've got more. Mm -hmm. We're not done. Yeah. Okay. The veterans of the Iron Brigade formed an association after the war, aptly named the Iron Brigade Association. In in the 1880s, the veterans opened that up to their family members. In 1992, surviving sons of Union veterans gave custodianship of the Iron Brigade Association to the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable. As the caretaking organization of the Milwaukee Civil War Roundtable, and on behalf of them, it is my pleasure to present a pin signifying membership in the Iron Brigade Association. Brad Johnson. So now you are now an official Packer fan. So Excellent. Oh, that's, that's that, a good that thing. That too. <laughs> and I'll throw, I'll throw out one aside. There was a reason when you read accounts of Gettysburg and you read accounts of the third day why Hancock's men were yelling Fredericksburg, mm -hmm. Fredericksburg at Pickett. That's right. Good point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gunn. Thank, Thank you here. very, very much. He's got his books for sale over here. Yeah. Yeah. That's our David, what do you got? Do I need a microphone? Oh, you got the, got the option. I'm sorry. All right, so I'll speak from back here. Playground voice, okay? Uh, Laura Rinaldi, who has some beautiful penmanship, by the way, she picked up Civil War battlefields then and now. Justin, you picked up secret missions of the Civil War. Donna, the Lincoln's portrait of a mirror, and General Bill Shelby's march. And then Paul picked up Lee and Grant, and Lincoln's journalist, John Hayes. So with the donations tonight, our fund is about $563 for our battlefield preservation, which is outside of our normal channel. So thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Anybody else? Well, with that, Next meeting is May 9th of the 12th Virginia Infantry. We hope to see you there. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming. <laughs>